Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, and uh, we want to look at King Saul tonight. You remember, if you've uh, been here on Wednesday nights for any length of time, uh, we have looked at uh, some interesting, what I call interesting things. We talked about decisions that we make, and I just uh, repeated for you that psychologists think that uh, we make 35,000 decisions a day, and some are subconscious, like we roll out of bed, we get in the car, put the key in and turn it, but some are conscious. We have to plan a meeting, we have to pay bills, we have to uh, be more specific. This amounts to 2,000 decisions per hour, psychologists tell us, or one decision every two seconds. And I raise the question, how many Christians do you think consult God for the majority of their important decisions? We looked at Mark chapter four where the disciples went with Jesus across the uh, Sea of Galilee and the storm came up. We said the promise that he gave them was let us pass to the other side. And then the principle that they operated on was that you could trust his word. And so they had his promise, a principle, and they had his presence. We talked about the fact that the word of God has three characteristic areas that we operate in relationship to all the time. One is the promises of God. The other are the principles that God gives to us in the Bible. And then the others are prophecies that God has given. And most of those prophecies will be carried out whether or not uh, we want them to or not. And uh, we talked about that. Then we went from uh, Mark chapter four over to Matthew seven. The last uh, two verses, or the last several verses there, 24 through 29, and talked about facing storms. And we talked about the men that built two different types of houses, one on the foundation of rock, the other on the foundation of sand. And uh, those uh, two men faced the same storms, the same rains, and the same floods. But the outcomes were different because Jesus said, um, he said, the man who built on the rock his house did not fall, and it was stable in the storms. Why? Because it was founded upon the rock, and the rock were the sayings that Jesus had given. And then the man who built his house on the sand did not follow the saying of Jesus, and his house was destroyed. Then we looked at the uh, account where Jesus meets the woman at the well. And in all of these accounts, we have promises, principles, and prophecies that are mentioned. Uh, in the meeting at the well, we have two waters, the water from Jacob's well, which has limited satisfying ability. Then we have the water that Jesus offered her, which has unlimited satisfying ability. We have a reference to two meats in the uh, passage. The disciples came back with food they purchased in a nearby village. That provides limited satisfaction. And uh, Jesus said that he had meat, which they knew not of, unlimited meat and that was uh, the souls of men. And then we talked about the two witnesses, the woman after she had found out that this was in fact the Messiah, she went into the city and gave her testimony. And the citizens came out to meet Jesus personally and they became witnesses. Then we talked about the fact there were two worships mentioned here. She was preoccupied with location. You say that in Jerusalem is the place men shall worship. But we worship in this mountain. And Jesus bypassed that. He didn't even comment on that. He went directly to uh, verses 21 through 24, where he said, you shall worship the Father. So she focused on location. He focused on a relationship with the Father. So in all of these situations, there were promises made, there were principles established, and there were prophecies they looked forward to the woman had a life of dissatisfaction. She had racial dissatisfaction. She was born a Samaritan and found no acceptance with Jews. She had social dissatisfaction. Nobody would come to the well with her because she'd been divorced four times and uh, was living with a man she was not married to. She had filial dissatisfaction because she could not stay in a marriage. And then she had religious dissatisfaction 
because she was still confused about the genuineness of worship. So we talked about making decisions on principles, promises, and prophecies. And uh, then we did running from a queen. We did uh, the life of Elijah, 1 Kings 19, 1 through 8. We talked about his running because he was focused on his physical life instead of his spiritual life. Uh, he had acted according to the word of God and had demonstrated great power. But then when he looked at the threat that Jezebel threw against him, he became weak and powerless and he spent a great deal of time heading toward depression. So uh, we talked about a number of things associated with that. So tonight I want to look at taking down a king. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and most of you probably are aware of the life of King Saul. Uh, we talked about in all of these individual uh, accounts we looked at, we said decisions have consequences. And in the earlier chapters, 13 through 14 of 1 Samuel, we find that Saul becomes king and he carries out some great military campaigns and because he was obeying the Lord and doing what he was supposed to do, he was defeating some very powerful enemies that Israel had. Saul had potential. Let's say this about potential. Potential that is not under the discipline of God's word becomes limited. Potential which is not under the discipline of God's word becomes limited. And as a result, Saul's decisions were affected, and the results of which were long-lasting. So God sent Samuel to Saul with a simple assignment. Here was the assignment. Chapter 15 and uh, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. So here's the assignment. Do what God says. God says it, do it. You don't have to understand what God says in order to obey. So in 15.1, we have the voice of the words of the Lord. And then in 15.2, thus saith the Lord. And then uh, we find as we go all the way down to verse 10, that this word of the Lord came to Samuel and he was to go and confront Saul on his disobedience. So Saul engaged in what we call sloppy decision-making because he ignored the promises of God, the principles of God, and the prophecies of God. Saul had not followed God's commandments. Matter of fact, look in verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So what happened? Well, God told uh, Saul that he was to go in and to destroy the Amalekites, take no spoil, take no prisoners, and uh, he violated that. It's bad enough to disobey God's word, wouldn't you say? But then it is far worse to lie about disobeying God's word. Samuel said, Wherefore didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? Look at verse 19. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? So Saul had actually taken the king captive, a matter of pride among kings to take another king captive and make him march as a defeated foe on a parade. And then they had gone to the spoil and taken the spoil that God said not to take. So Samuel said, Wherefore didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? And look what Saul said in verse 20. Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. <laughs> Don't you see what's happening here? He's making excuses, and he's actually lying about obeying God. Well, wrong decisions can lead to the denial of the obvious. And what is the denial of the obvious? Denying that the wrong decisions did, in fact, occur. That's exactly what he does. Samuel, Samuel heard from God that Saul had not obeyed, 
So God told Samuel to tell Saul, you didn't obey. So Samuel goes and tells Saul, you didn't obey the Lord. And Saul's response is, I obeyed the Lord. So what armies could not do to King Saul, King Saul did to himself by ignoring the word of God. He was undefeated militarily, but he was not undefeated personally. Now notice, moving ahead to verse 23 of chapter 15. Well, let's pick, let's pick up in verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You know, one of the most misunderstood concepts in modern day Christianity is that disobedience is actual rejection of the word of God. We need to think about that when we decide we're going to disobey. So what armies could not do to King Saul, King Saul did to himself by ignoring the word of the Lord. Notice the number of times that Saul refused to admit his disobedience. And then notice also the number of excuses and blame shiftings that he engaged in. One act of disobedience, remember last time when we were talking about these series, one act of disobedience sets the stage for other acts of disobeying God's word. And I said, this becomes a rotten chain in a person's life. And the only way to gain victory is to break the chain. And all decisions that you and I make without consulting God's word are vulnerable decisions. And those vulnerable decisions are laden with potential for more vulnerable decisions which we make independent of God's word. So Saul finally realized he could no longer deceive Samuel or God. So what does he do? Look at verse 24. Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Well, first of all, the leader is to give direction, not take it from the congregation, right? He says, I have sinned, I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord. The word transgressed is an interesting Hebrew word. It means to know what a boundary is, deliberately walk up to it, and deliberately step across it regardless of the consequences. All decisions have consequences. And Saul's choice to disobey God's word led to severe outcomes for the king. So why don't we look at one, two, three, four, five. Let's look at six things that happened when Saul decided to disobey the Lord. First of all, it angered God. Go back to verse 11. says, it repenteth me, God speaking now to Samuel, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. So we anger God. I think we're at a time in modern Christianity where no one is really concerned about angering God. I'm concerned about angering God. <laughs> I don't want God to be angry with me. I even tell him that sometimes when I'm praying and talking to him. Lord, I don't want to do anything to cause you to be angry with me. I love you. You loved me. You sent your son to die on the cross to pay for my sin. So if your word says for me to do something, I want to do it. So the first thing that happened was Saul angered God. Then look at verse 11, the last part of it. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Have you ever grieved someone else by your own disobedience? I thought about this. 
over the years I have worked with other pastors and I have tried to be an encouragement to pastors and encouragement to some people in church sometimes I've invested long hours with people to try to help build them up spiritually and then see them do a foolish stupid thing make a decision to completely abandon the Word of God as Saul did here and uh, I suffered grief for a long time. I was on the phone this week with another pastor and we were sharing our grief over a decision of somebody we tried to help. It grieved Samuel. But notice there was a third thing that happened here. Uh, it resulted in permanent loss of the kingdom. It resulted in the permanent loss of the kingdom. Look at 1523. So the Lord saved, I'm in the wrong chapter, 15, 1523. 1523, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he, the Lord, hath also rejected thee from being king. What an amazing statement. We talked, uh, I think I preached Sunday on lost opportunities. And Saul had the opportunity to be one of the great kings of Israel. He didn't lack potential, but he lacked potential committed to the Lord. So it resulted in the loss of the kingdom. Notice the words in verse 26. Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. Saul pleads with him to you know, come back. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So what happened when Saul decided that he would do what Saul wanted to do instead of what God told him to do? He angered God. <clears throat> Secondly, he grieved Samuel, and then he lost the kingdom. But there's a fourth thing that happened too. He revealed that he paid more attention to what people told him to do than what God told him to do. Verse 24, Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the command of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You know, we don't have, if we're really committed to the Lord, we don't have to fear anybody. We just simply do what God tells us to do. And God never promises that when we obey him that there won't be any problems, there won't be any conflict, and there won't be any opposition. He just tells us to obey him. But notice not only did it anger God, not only did it grieve Samuel, not only did it result in the loss of the opportunity to be king, and not only did it show that he feared the people more than God, but it hindered true worship. It's amazing the number of people who don't obey the Bible but think they worship. Worship is deeply attached to obedience. So notice verse 25. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Samuel said, no, that's not going to happen. Your worship is affected. I'm amazed at the number of people who think worship is attending church. You can worship anywhere, but there are congregational worships mentioned in the Bible. The, in the Old Testament, when they were traveling the wilderness, the tabernacle, then they built the temple. And interestingly, when Jesus went into a town, he often went to the synagogue. Paul went to the synagogues immediately so he could preach the word of God that Jesus, that he had previously persecuted, was the Messiah. Worship is a relationship between the worshiper and the one worshiped. And it doesn't have to be within four walls, but the Bible does make it clear that we have an obligation to the church, which is the bride of Christ. So it hindered true worship. He wanted to continue to have a relationship with the Lord. He wanted to continue to be able to interact with Samuel, the prophet. So notice verse 35. The first thing it did, it angered God, verse 11. It grieved Samuel, verse 11. Resulted in the loss of the kingdom, verse 23 and 26. 
uh, revealed that he feared the people more than the Lord, verse 24, hindered true worship, verse 25. And look at number 35. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. It broke fellowship with Samuel. Think about the opportunity to fellowship with one of the great prophets, and that was lost. Remember, all decisions have consequences, and when we make decisions, we need to think in terms of God's promises, God's principles, and God's prophecies. And every decision that we make must include at least one of those, and in most cases, all three of them together. So all decisions have consequences. So if we obey God's word, the outcomes will be positive in our relationship with the Lord. If we disobey God's word, the outcomes will be negative in terms of our relationship to the Lord. So I think one of the great lessons that I've learned in all my years of being saved is to learn to do what God says to do, even if I do not understand why he says to do it. I can't explain every command in the Bible but I know what the command is. And as soon as I know what the command is, my immediate obligation is obedience. And Samuel reminds us that when we disobey, we're actually in rebellion against the creator of the universe. And in verse 23, he tells us that to disobey is as rebellion, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So what he's trying to get us to see here is that like Pharisees, we can put on an outward display that has no heart. We can put on sacrifices and disobey God. So an external act, offering a sacrifice, following through with certain things is never better than obeying the word of the Lord. One of the excuses that Saul gave, if you go back and read the 15th chapter, when Samuel heard the sheep and, and, the, and the cattle, he asked Saul, if you've obeyed God, how come I hear the bleeding of the sheep? And of course, Saul says, well, we brought those back to sacrifice to the Lord. God is not interested in our offering him the sacrifice of our own disobedience. He's not interested in it. He's interested in obedience. Do what I say do. He loves us, and the reason he gives us principles to live by is because he loves us. The reason he gives us commands to obey is because he loves us. And the reason he prophesies certain things that are going to actually occur in our future is because he loves us. So we may make thousands of decisions a day, but those decisions have the potential to become rotten chains if we refuse to obey the Lord. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. And we ask you now to speak to our hearts. Help us to realize that we desperately need you and that every day without a close relationship with you is a lost day. And we open the altar now. I pray you speak to our hearts. Help us to do what you want us to do, we pray in Jesus' name.